Welcome to the Talent Equation Podcast. If you are passionate about helping young people to unleash their potential and want to find ways to do that better, then you've come to the right place. The Talent Equation Podcast seeks to answer the important questions facing parents, coaches, and talent developers as they try to help young people become the best they can be. This is a series of unscripted, unpolished conversations between people at the razor's edge of the talent community who are prepared to share their knowledge, experiences, and challenges in an effort to help others get better, faster. Listen, reflect, and don't forget to join the discussion at thetalentequation.co.uk. Enjoy the show. everyone, it's uh, Stuart here again, coming uh, back for another episode of the Talent Equation podcast. This week I've got uh, Lauren Anderson from Rise Volleyball making a welcome return. Uh, we we spent, uh, Lauren featured early on in the uh, in the podcast's uh, first few episodes and um, we've been in discussions ever since and, um, and it's a really interesting discussion that we have. We get into quite deep um uh, sort of thoughts and reflections about so our experiences and some of the situations we find ourselves in and kind of what what motivates us and what you know really affects us and sort of uh you know get gets to uh, challenging our ability to perform uh, we jump straight in lauren's out for a walk uh, so there's a little bit of a uh, little bit of traffic noise in the background but uh, he uh, so he was uh, sort of walking and talking as part of his uh, morning ritual. Didn't want to get in the way of that because, as you'll hear in the podcast, that's uh, that's an important part of uh, him getting himself ready for uh, his uh, his day with day as a coach. So uh, you'll you'll hear that, and then um, we'll and then you'll just hear us straight into the conversation. So uh, sit back, relax. Um, might be one for uh, to bring a notebook with. Uh, get yourself psyched up because uh, it's, it's a really good conversation. One of my early guest, earlier guests. Uh, I think you know you were you might have even been like episode say seven or eight or something along those lines. So some people may not have been through the entire archive of the Talent Equation. So I wonder if you wouldn't mind just sort of giving us your kind of um, potted history around uh, what you do and, and how you got into it again, just uh, just to remind people or to introduce new people to what you do. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think you know. It, it's funny you brought that up because I was thinking just as we were getting ready to do this today, how many more people you've had on the show since I was on there and um, being someone who's really into the talent development idea and all of the things that you're uh, that you're exploring through this podcast, it's very uh, interesting, I guess is one word. Uh, humbling is another to look at the list of people that you've had on your show and they're all people that I consider to be some of my almost heroes in the in the realm of talent development and sports coaching and so for me to be able to come back on and uh, in some way equate myself with them simply by being on your podcast is a really I don't know it's just a cool thing for me and I really appreciate the opportunity but uh, to get into who I am and you know help anybody out who hasn't listen to the previous episode we did um, I am uh, I'm a volleyball coach I run a volleyball academy in uh, uh, Meridian, Idaho which is a suburb of Boise, Idaho um, in the United States obviously um, and I got into this I got into the sport of volleyball um, at the age of 18 um, after I graduated from a high school here in the United States and went off to college and started um uh, exposed to the beach side of our game, the doubles side, and just absolutely fell in love with it and started playing it on a regular basis. And uh, then through that, became aware of and started playing in the indoor sixes game. Um, and very quickly after that, became a coach. Uh, I was just really passionate about the game and learning more about it. And um, connected with some folks who needed a high school coach and got into that 
been over the years. I've coached everything from five-year-olds up to the college-age players, um, and uh, yeah, I've coached you know both in the high school realm, the school side of things here, as well as the uh, club side of things here. And eight years ago, I just decided that I wanted to figure out a way. I don't know. I'll be very honest. I'm, I, I've struggled most of my my life. I'm 43 now, and I've struggled most of my life trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. You know, what was that thing I wanted to do when I grew up? Um, and somewhere about 10 years ago, I decided I wanted to make a career out of coaching. And um, I think you know, it's a it's it's a difficult thing to do for somebody who didn't finish college because I did not. And um, you know, I there's some definitely some tried and true tracks that you can follow to become a a career coach, uh, but most of those involve coaching at the collegiate realm um, here in the United States, at least. If you want to make a career of coaching, really the only way to do it, um, or the established way to do it, is to become a collegiate coach. And I didn't really want to do that. I wanted to be involved at the the developmental level. That's where I'm more passionate about. And so I just started really looking around to see how how I could make a career out of coaching, um, but do it at with the younger kids and the answer came back to just you know starting my own club and uh, eight years ago we started out with uh, five teams about 40 athletes and now we've grown to as i said uh, 21 teams and uh, around 210 athletes so that's brief synopsis of my uh, history in the sport so um I think I think it, many people who probably listen to the podcast um, would probably be quite jealous, really, because um, you know you're you're somebody who's had the foresight and the drive and the desire to you know make coaching your career, make it your living. Um, you know, and it, it's clear from the previous podcast we had, and I always say with the podcast, by the way, um, you know, it's only as good as the guests I have on. So for for every uh, every ounce of gratitude you have towards me, I have it right back towards you for helping me launch the whole project in the first place. Uh, it's still it's still one of the conversations that uh, I think about when um, you know, when I think about uh, this this whole journey I've been on because it was one of those conversations that almost kind of cemented in my mind that it was worth doing this whole project because you know we had such a great exchange of thoughts and ideas that I've, that was a big part of what I wanted to do was to just be able to just speak with like-minded people and explore different ideas with them so my thanks go right back to you but um on your on the journey that you've been on um you know, there's a lot of people out there who are still uh, and I'm in this bracket you know I mean I've managed to make coaching my career but I've managed to do it by basically becoming a you know, a coach developer or, a, you know, somebody who's involved in the development of coaching systems. Uh, I haven't been able to make actual coaching in my career. Uh, that's still something that I do essentially as a sideline or as, as a voluntary role. Um, so there's a number of people, I think, on this podcast who would probably be quite jealous of you. Um, but I'd be interested just to hear from you, actually, a little bit around... Um, You know, if you're sort of embarking on this as a career, it's essentially now your livelihood. What what do the what are the kind of how does that change things for you in terms of the way you have to kind of manage yourself and the amount of time you get to spend in the gym versus out of the gym and all those different dynamics? Well, that's a really good question. I mean, the answer to that is going to completely erase any jealousy that people might have for what I do. I think. You know, I it, I tell people all the time. I I absolutely feel very lucky um, in that I get to do what I love every day of my life. But there is a lot of work put into it. Um, there's, you know, I'm I'm very happy to do that. Though. It's it's what I enjoy. I, you know, and I have the life. I guess not necessarily intentionally, but I have the the life outside of my job to support, um, support what I do. You know, I'm, I'm single, I'm single guy who, you know, lives alone with two, uh, Siberian Huskies who tend to, um, be the number one thing that keeps me, uh, sane in some days. Um, but you know, it allows me the freedom of, to just kind of do whatever, is necessary to keep the business side of what we do going. 
And so, you know, during club season, during our team season, which is going on right now, I certainly spend, I spend probably, um, 60 to 70 hours, uh, a week on what we're doing. Um, and so, I mean, that's a lot of time. Um, but I think that again, I don't really consider it work. It's, I love it every minute that I'm doing it. Well, I guess that's a little hyperbole, but, um, I certainly, the vast majority of my time spent, um, on this is, is enjoyable. So I don't really consider it work. I consider it that opportunity to do what I love and I'm making a living off of it. So I think that's, you know, there was definitely a few authors somewhere along the lines that I read their books that said, that's the secret to happiness, do what you love and figure out a way to get paid for it. And, uh, that's what I somehow managed to do that. And so it is luck, um, in a, in a sense that it worked out. Um, as far as managing it goes, you know, I mean, there's, there's certainly a lot of things that I have to do that I don't enjoy the business side of things. I'm not very good at, um, which is why I've hired someone else to be kind of my business manager. He also coaches for my program. He's also a huge lover of the game of volleyball, but he manages the financial side and the business side of things for me. And I think that was a huge step. Um, I did that after two years and that's allowed me to, it's really been part of our success and our continued existence is being able to have somebody who could do that. Um, and as far as on a personal level, you know, I think, gosh, I mean, you, you, you have to, uh, you have to take care of yourself in order to be able to give your full self to the athletes that you work with. And so I think, you know, making sure that I'm staying healthy and, um, you know, taking care of myself, eating well and exercising and feeling mentally, uh, 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 happy every day and being able to bring that full side of myself into the gym with the kids and the coaches that I work with, because part of my job is also developing the coaches who work with me. And so if I, can make sure that I am uh, fully and completely happy and, uh, could, you know, there and available. Um, I think it allows our program to be more so as well. So, so how, how do you, um, in terms, what does a sort of um, average, I know you won't have an average day, but generally speaking, what would be an average day for you? What would it look like? Uh, well, uh, an average day, get up in the morning, I'm pretty early riser um not as early as some but i'm usually up by six or seven at the latest in the morning um, i get up i take the dogs for a walk um, i might read um some things that i had found the day before that i had saved just as something to do early in the morning um i usually um uh, you know we're i live in the northwest united states and if People who aren't from the United States aren't aware of our culture here. The Northwest, one of our tried and true cultural symbols of the Northwest is coffee. Um, it's a huge thing for pretty much, I don't know, for me it is. Um, I'm, a, I'm a coffee snob almost, and so I usually will go. We have amazing coffee um, shops here, and so that's usually part of my daily routine is to get up and go to the coffee shop early in the morning order my standard um, coffee and then uh, sit down and um, I usually I, I my new I guess I would call it a new part of my routine is I don't I, I I'm making that my time and not the volleyball business time and so I really strive to stay away from checking emails and those kind of things I sit down over coffee and I find things that I want to read or videos that I want to watch, things that are more about just my personal development and my enjoyment. Um, and so that's usually about an hour of my morning. Uh, and then I'll turn towards the business side of things. And that's either going directly to our gym where, where I have my office or I might just go home and do it or things along those lines. It kind of depends on the day. But I, you know, by 9 or 10 o'clock every morning, my my time is turned towards running my business and towards the kids that I deal with. Deal with the right term, the, <laughs> um, the kids that I work with. 
um, and my coaches. And I just start thinking about, okay, what are we going to do today? What's, what do I need to work on today? What's the next step today? And you're right. It, there really isn't an average day because every day is a new, new adventure in a sense, a new hurdle. And, um, so I just, so the, the development, the messages I'm sending to my coach. Kids in our program, uh, and so, and then by a, we start rolling into the gym, and we start our training process, and we're in the gym with various kids and teams until ten o'clock at night. So, from four to six is kind of that coaching period, the actual hands-on coaching, and from ten to four is more of the planning, planning uh, or short-term, just that day planning. And then, um, yeah, that's kind of my day. And then when I'm done, I get home. It's about usually by about 11 o'clock at night. And um, I kind of try to unwind a little by watching uh, something, again, that's absolutely mindless. It has nothing to do with volleyball or coaching. And then I go to sleep, and it starts all over the next day. It's, uh, it's really interesting because, I mean, I, I listen to, I've listened to a lot of podcasts, and I listen to... Um I listen to quite a lot of sort of business podcasts or Tim Ferriss podcasts, and I he always asks people about what their routine is, and I always find it quite fascinating. And even just reflecting now on um, on you know your kind of your schedule or your time, and then and I you know there's a part of me that thinks that that would be an ideal morning for me, <laughs> which is to um, you know like you say go out, go for a walk, take the dogs for a walk, you know, and then go to the coffee shop and, and read. That that would be a like almost perfect morning. Um, sadly, they don't quite come like that anymore because um, I'm usually uh, heading into London on a train. But, but I did, in, interestingly enough, though, I was reflecting. I do a little bit something similar, which is you know just to spend some time getting up and almost just giving myself at least ten to fifteen minutes of me time where I get an opportunity to read um, and just to sort of you know kind of acquaint myself with the world or find something interesting that might be uh, just stimulate a thought process and, and share something. So, you yeah, know, just fascinating to hear kind of how people... And what's interesting to hear you say as well, and I, and I think this is something that's very live in my um, in my world at the moment, is listening to you talk about um, how you feel it's important to get yourself in the right state in order to be your best self when you're in the gym. And I think that's really, really interesting because I know that um, one of the issues that I'm talking about a lot at the moment is quite a lot of coaches who are literally hanging by a thread to a certain extent um, because they are either trying to manage a full-time job and then do their coaching or they're under significant pressure to deliver certain results or whatever it might be and actually how it sort of becomes a bit of a a grind for them you know it becomes something that's sort of a little bit monotonous because they're not creating the space for their own recreation and their own uh, opportunity to sort of take stock and spend time on themselves in order to be the best selves for the athletes and that's definitely been for me this year it's been one of my biggest challenges is you know there's been times when I've been been turning up to the pitch at sort of six and I'm not as well prepared as I want to be and I'm not as as good as I want to be in the session and I'm coming away from it and I think you know the kids have had a de- the kids have had a good experience, but I've come away from it really dissatisfied because uh, I've not given them my best self, and then that that really gets to me, and it and it and it, it takes away some of the experience for me. Yeah, I com- completely agree. I've I've gone through that multiple times over my coaching career, and I think about five six years ago, as after we had started the club, I realized I was going down that route again where. I'm the type of person that when I find something I enjoy, uh, I give myself 100% to it. And I think that the, that's a really great quality. But at the same time, you have to figure out a way to kind of fill back, fill your tank back up again and, um, and give some time to yourself. Um, or you don't have 100% to give to the things that you love. And I think that's true of anything in life, but definitely when you're working with, uh, kids and helping them develop into amazing adults um you know you part of 
part of that is modeling what it means to be an amazing adult and what it means to be uh, well-adjusted and well-rounded and have multiple interests and have a well-balanced life. And if you, as a coach, um, are coming into the gym and your 100% whole life is dedicated to just working with those kids, I don't think you're modeling a very good and healthy lifestyle for those kids to to pick up on from you. So, so it's yeah, it's, I think it's a challenge and finding. I mean, I think it's a challenge for anybody in any walk of life, but finding that balance is a real is a real key. But I think the the message, I, did, I think the take. One of the things I learned actually from a really good friend of mine, Jamie Edwards, who hasn't been on the show yet, and I'm hoping to get him on eventually. Um, I went on a training course with him. It's called Train Brain. And actually, one of the things he gave me a really good piece of perspective was he said, you've basically got three balls. He says, you've got your uh, you've got your relationship ball, you've got your personal ball, and you've got your work ball. And they can't be the same size. So you have to make a decision about which, you know, whenever one gets bigger, one of the other ones has to get smaller. Mm-hmm. And I was reflecting on it, and I realized that my work, when my work ball gets big, um, my personal ball, and I include my coaching in my personal ball and all the other things that I do, um, that, yeah, I don't want to get that to get smaller. So the only one, so the one that has to get smaller is my relationship, which is family. Yeah. And it was like a real eye opener for me because I realized that actually that I don't want to do that. I don't want that to get smaller. But I always, and I realized then that whenever my wife started to get, kind of frustrated or slightly less less happy with me it was because i was allowing that ball to get smaller i came i came back from this training session and this is like my advert for uh, for what jamie does um and my wife said to me she said you like husband 2.0 what's happened to you <laughs> <laughs> i didn't go on the course for that reason but it was a pretty good a pretty good uh, now i reckon she still she probably now thinks i need need an upgrade again but anyway yeah yeah so it was, uh, yeah, it's interesting how just doing that almost just gave me that bit of perspective. And, and to be fair, I think since then I've always hopefully had a balance slightly better. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a great, uh, a great thing to happen. I, I know for me, the, the critical, um, I guess the spark for my thoughts on that was, um, Joe Ehrman, um, an ex NFL football player here in the United States wrote a book called Inside Out Coaching. And, um, in the book, he had a statement that said, you know, if we're, if we are acting as coaches to help young men and women become, or young girls and boys to become, uh, young men and women of character and competence and confidence, then we have to make sure we have those qualities before we step into the arena with them. And I just thought that was a really fantastic statement towards a lot of different things. Of course, it applies to how we coach and how we interact with those, the kids that we're developing, but it also was a statement towards the life that you lead before you step into that arena with those athletes. And, um, I thought that was just a, you know, a really great statement about that you know i've known a lot of coaches and i've been there too who um you have maybe your life isn't really great you've you're you're frustrated about things in your own life or things just aren't going the way they're supposed to for you so you're just you're you're frustrated and you use you're trying to use coaching as the one thing that's bringing you joy Mm. and i think that's a really bad place to be because the kids don't get the full you they don't get the authentic self that you should be bringing into the gym with them, you're using them as a means towards happiness. And I think any time an adult is using a child as a means towards happiness, it leads to problems. Uh, I think you're right. And I've definitely been in that place. Um, you know, and in fact, uh, I, I, again, my reflections even of recently, you know, I was talking to someone recently about this and you know, I, I would definitely go up to a session and beforehand I wouldn't necessarily be in the right frame of mind and afterwards I would be a lot happier and I'd feel, wow, I'm really glad I did that because that was really good fun and yeah, and I really enjoyed it. But it definitely should be the place you go. I don't feel that's right. I don't, I totally agree. I don't feel that I should be going there because it's gonna, you know, it's kind of, oh wow, I'm glad I did that. That was really good fun. I kind of need to be in a different state in order to be able to perform at my optimum. 
And I talked a lot with um, Kendall McQuaid, um, again, in one of the early podcasts, and he talks about getting into flow in coaching. And, and I, 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 that's the bit that I'm missing because when, it, when I'm in it, when I'm immersed, when I'm in the right state, it is, a, it is like flow. It, it is, you know, I lose myself in that, in that moment and I haven't been getting into that space at all and I miss it. And that, that's the bit that is, um, it, it's because I'm not in the right state as I go into it. So I'm not even able to access flow. It's purely a, a job almost. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I, I, I feel it's very apparent to me when I'm, bringing my own, uh, uh, my own issues, my own, uh, emotional state, negative emotional state into the gym with the kids. It's really apparent to me now. And I, I'm certainly not going to say that I'm awesome at, uh, recognizing it and changing it, but I, I've gotten a lot better about it in that, you know, I, as soon as I start feeling that, creep in or start feeling that um, where I, I can certainly feel the outside world affecting the way that I'm developed working with these kids. Um, it's, it doesn't take me long to just look one of them in the eye and realize, you know, my, what I do next may have a very long effect on this child. And it's my choice at this moment to change that. And make sure that the effect that I have is a positive one on this athlete. And, you know, to be honest, sometimes that's not fun for me as a coach to look my look myself in the eye, in a sense, and say, you're not doing the right thing right now. And I've come away from I come away from more sessions, I would say. And I don't know if this is good or bad, but I definitely would say that I come away from more sessions these days, more training sessions with my athletes. Um I would go so far as to say frustrated, but certainly unhappy with my um, with the level that we're at. You know, I I'm one of those people that it constantly feels like we can do better, and um, and so for me, I come away from a lot of sessions like feeling, well, that was good, but man, we had a there was a lot of opportunity for growth on the coaching side there, and. I guess, you know, to compare that to what you were saying about, you know, you come away from a session feeling like, well, that was a lot of fun. We did it. We had, you know, that was a great session. That was fun. I want to come back again tomorrow. Um, I'm not sure which one is better or if you need maybe a little bit of both <laughs> um, over time. So, um, Now, this is an interesting subject because I was talking about this recently. Um, I'm, uh, I'm part of um, Mark Upton and rick shuttleworth relearn program um and a group of us got together for a a webinar um the other day and we were sort of in some sort of small breakout discussion groups all online and um i was reflecting on this because one of the questions i posed was how do i know if i'm any good and the reason i'm saying that and it sort of alludes i think a little bit to what you're saying i might be wrong here but but um so uh, I'm working largely at the moment with sort of fairly recreational players. Um, some of them are developing, but most of them are, you know, pretty recreational. So it's actually relatively straightforward for me, actually, to provide them with, you know, a good session. I can, I can, I can put something on for them that they will enjoy and they'll come back to and they'll get something out. But I've recently been reflecting that I don't think I'm doing a very good job. I could be doing a much better job, and I've, that's where a source of my frustration was coming from. But part of this is stems to the fact that is when you're working in the way we're working which is uh, it's a sort of a what i would consider to be a a less than traditional approach um it's not immediately apparent um that your methods are working and sometimes um your methods are actually experimental for you um you know so it's not immediately apparent whether you're having the effect that you were having. Whereas if I was to use a more sort of linear approach, then I could map it out over, say, a period of time and go, right, I would expect us to be here, here, here and here by this time. And I'd be able to kind of track and measure if we were on progress. Now, I can sort of still do that to a certain extent. But with the approach I'm taking, which is now much more exploratory, I find it much harder to be able to clearly keep a track of 
or even know if we're moving at the pace we should be moving at. We're moving at the pace we're moving at. Now, is that the right pace? Is it not the right pace? Is Are we slow because it's me and I'm not doing what I need to be doing? Are we slow because it's them and they don't get it? I don't know. And I've got no real way of kind of unpicking that. And I'm finding that quite difficult. So I'm trying to sort of say, you know, am I actually deluding myself? Am I any good at this? Um, I find it quite a challenge to, uh, to sort of really think about that and, and find a means by which to, which is kind of why I'm wanting Mark and Rick to a certain extent to sort of come and watch me and go, right, this is where you're all right. These are the areas where you can improve because I haven't got anybody who can actually do that for me right now. Uh, I think that's, yeah, fantastic point. Uh, thoughts that go through my head constantly in this gym. You know, we, we, we buy, we bought in 100% to this. And I know that you are trying to move away from these terminology, this terminology, but you know, this nonlinear ecological, uh, game sense, game based training, all fancy terms that don't really get to the point of what we're doing. Um, but you know, we, we bought into this and we are doing it a hundred percent in our gym and it doesn't produce instantaneously, you know, you know, instantaneously visual results. And so then you have to figure out another way to measure your success. And I'm not sure I've been able to figure that out yet. Um, how do you, how do you measure success measure being a linear process in a nonlinear system? Um, I'm sure there's someone out there, uh, maybe uh, David Snowden or somebody like that, who's a master <laughs> of of systems and you know that Kniffen framework and all those things. I'm sure somebody like him could come in and say, "This is how you measure it. This is what you can do." But I haven't figured that out yet. And so for us, it's you know it's trusting the process and. Um, Long term, you know, I mean, it's it, you do see it in the long term with our kids. You know, we have a team, a, a 15 and under team this year who's made up of uh, there's 10 kids and eight of them have been in our program now for four years. And to see the things that they're capable of at their age, it's very unique in our gym. Um, are there other areas of the country and other places in our local area that have players of equal ability and teams of equal ability. Absolutely. But for our, for our program, it's very unique. And so, you know, I think that's where we see it. Um, but then it also comes down to just because we see it, does not mean it's really happening? You know, I mean, uh, are we just finding the things that we're looking for and, you know, kind of like reinforcing our own beliefs um, is there really actually improvement happening or are, you know, or is it different than if we would have been training a different way? Um, uh, those are all questions that, that come up and, and make us just kind of wonder, like, are we, are we doing the right thing? Are we making the right choices? Could we be better at coaching? Uh, could we be better at doing it the way we're doing it? Or is the way we're doing it the best choice? Um, they're daily. Those are daily questions for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad it's not just me. Um, uh, uh, but I mean, I, I know that there are a number of us out there who are sort of, like you say, you know, in, in, engaged in this. And I suppose the, the the fact that we have these questions is an important part of the process, isn't it? Because um, if we didn't have these questions, then we wouldn't be probably even in the space we are right now, which is this continuous quest to improve. I mean, I embarked on this journey several years ago, but I embarked on it because, you know, I I just felt that, that it, I don't know why, I, I we've talked about this before, haven't we, but, you know, there, there was just something. I didn't, it, it wasn't right, you know, it didn't feel right. It, and also, I wasn't getting the results. I mean, so that's the interesting thing, working the way I was previously, I definitely knew I wasn't getting the results, you know, so we would do certain things in training and we would come into uh, matches and the almost exact opposite of what we'd done in training would be, would sort of um, play out before my eyes. 
so I knew that I wasn't having the effect I was having and I found it enormously frustrating and certainly when I was younger a lot of that I would often put on the players you know. in deep down inside I, I would they just don't get it they just clearly aren't capable <laughs> of getting it where they want to get it um, and then I, so I've come to realise now so I don't I don't get that as much so maybe that's one of the measures I probably could use is that I don't actually get that level of they just don't get it now what I get is they're sort of getting it they're sort of I can see them sort of getting it sort of trying to get it at least anyway maybe they might not execute but they're sort of trying to get it so for me it, now the bit going back to your point around could I be better at doing this I definitely think I can if, to, if you were to use a karate belt analogy, I'd love to know where I am, how far away from a black belt am I? Um, because my own perception of how far I, I, I am away is I think I'm like a yellow belt, which is, I think, fairly low. I'm not that familiar with karate belts. But, um, but I'd love someone to say, yeah, you know, you're, you're here and actually you do this, you do that, you do the other. And actually, maybe you could just get that little bit better and you could tighten it up. Um, so that that's the bit, I think, for me that I'm now that's the next stage i i, I hear you and I, I i agree yellow i believe is the next step up from white in most of the systems that i've been exposed to so yeah i think but the problem there is and this is the funny thing for me and i find myself doing the same thing we've bought into this concept of nonlinear uh learning environment We've bought into this idea that we um, there is no um, step by step path to greatness, and yet when we talk about it, what did you just do, and what do I do all the time? I go into a step by step evaluation of myself or of the players in front of me, and I create something as linear as colored belts to determine <laughs> how good I am. <laughs> or you know and i think you know we we were we're guilty of holding ourselves as coaches to a standard of thought or a, a a paradigm of thought that we have decided not to hold our children to anymore yeah um and i think that's you know we're doing ourselves a disservice there when we say, well, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I, it's, it, you, but it's, that's the way our world works. I mean, you look at any coaching accreditation program, any coaching license program, however it's termed around the world, every one of them has levels. And the guy who's the level five is considered to be better than the guy who's level one. Yeah. Um, and yet we were recognizing even, even within that, we're recognizing that the children don't learn linearly and that just because a child is 16 doesn't mean that they're better than the kid that's 14 or because a kid's played for four years, they're better than a kid that's played for two years. We recognize all of that. And yet on the coaching side, we our actions, basically, and mostly just because of cultural influence, I think, our actions don't hold to the same concept. And, you know, I, we like to talk here a lot about the fact that when we hire coaches for our program, I don't really care about their pedigree, you know, their, how many, where they played and how many years they've coached because I really feel like being a great coach, just like being a great volleyball player is a nonlinear journey. It's, it's complex. There's so many things influencing how good of a coach you're going to be that you can't measure it on a linear scale and you can't rank it and you can't have stages it's you know it is experience a great thing absolutely but i've also known some people who've been able to step in and coach with little to no experience in coaching volleyball because they were good at other things you know they may be someone who's just a really amazing second grade teacher steps into the gym with some kids and uses all the all of the uh, principles of teaching second graders when they're working with these you know maybe 14 and under volleyball players and they become a, and they're a great coach because of that and so i think it's uh, just an interesting topic and sorry i, I kind of went off <laughs> not that that's a that, not that that's a new thing but 
you know, I just find myself doing the same thing where I start thinking about myself and my journey in a linear fashion uh, while recognizing that learning in general is not linear. And so it's it's just, there's just a weird dichotomy there, I think. I think that's um, that's a great observation. And I'm sort of glad you um, you caught me while I was in my you know pit of despair with my karate, <laughs> with my karate belt because you're right you um uh actually and I, I was actually i've been conceptualizing this recently as part of some work we're doing around how we can reconceptualize sort of you know coach development and and actually we were talking about it much more as a as a circular process so it's if you imagine it's almost like being in the center of a tornado and moving from the base of the tornado upwards through the funnel so you're growing outwards but it's it's a spiral around you yep um and that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go into a different context i.e you know you don't have to go to level five or level six or whatever it is you know in a different domain like high performance you can do that entirely within your environment so as a talent development coach within a club, it's about how can you grow outwards as opposed to grow upwards. And you can grow yes. upwards as well, um, uh, you know. And and but but the bit that's difficult is because, like you say, we're used to linear measures as a mechanism by which to um, consider growth and improvement. Um, until we can find another way of conceptualizing it, it's quite difficult. And like you say, maybe it is a Dave Snowden job. Um, yeah. with complexity science. Well, I recently came across a series of articles. Uh, I think I was found the link to them in um, maybe something by Mark Upton or... Yeah, that'll be about right. Like, um, might have been someone else. I can't remember for sure the other Mark. Um, and it it's Larry Paul, and he's writing this... I think it's up to 35 or 36 chapter posts on LinkedIn um, about finding uh, quality in youth soccer um, using uh, Zen and the art of motorcycle motorcycle maintenance as his uh, framework, I guess. So the work of Robert Persig. Um, and I'm fascinated with it because it's it's just about this idea of how do we label quality? How do we know whether what we have is good or not? And what do we consider good? And how do we measure good? Because, you know, I mean, it's, it, if you haven't read them, if you haven't looked at them, I highly suggest them. I'm about 14 chapters into it. And it's, I, it's probably the most my brain has worked in many, many years to try to not only understand the concepts, but where my thought process goes as I'm reading it. And it's very fascinating. And, um, but it's, it's much on the line of what you're talking about. Like how do we, we've come to this belief in our culture and our sports youth sports culture that we can measure these things. And because we can measure them, they matter. And I've, I have an issue with that, that just because you can measure it doesn't mean it matters. It just means it's easier to, it's just means it's easy to measure. And some things, I think probably the most important things in youth sports are things we can't measure very easily. And so we choose not to pay a lot of attention to them. You know, the things that really do matter, things like what kind of people are they becoming because of their experience in this sport? We can't really measure that, but that's probably the most important thing to me as a youth sports coach. I, I think I think you're absolutely right. And having said that, I, I think if we could find a way of maybe maybe it's just the nature of the beast that actually measurement is even just the wrong thing. But if you could find a way of measuring, then for me, I think there would be. So, and interestingly, I'm experimenting with that with um, one of Mark's um, one of Mark's colleagues, a guy called Al Smith, who's very into um, Dave Snowden's work and the Kinevin framework and complexity theory. Um, around how we can begin to, um, uh, at the very least, um, infer from people's um, re reflections of their experience, their lived experiences, how we can begin to uh, understand uh, 
the impact we might have so that we have a reference point. And, and for me, that's actually quite important because um, one of the things I try to do with coaching is to, uh, if you like, make the case. Um, not everybody understands coaching like you or I and understands the impact. Um, we we understand it kind of implicitly. It, it makes total sense to us, but not everybody does. Some people think, well, if I've got to make a, an investment into an intervention to help, for example, tackle child, childhood obesity, let's say, um, do I invest in a facility that will enable young people to be able to participate or do I invest in coaching? And when you invest in a facility, firstly, you've got something physical to see. And secondly, yes. you can see people using it. It doesn't, ne it doesn't necessarily matter too much as to whether the experience they're having is a good one or not. They've got a facility and people are using it. That's very simple and very easy to see and people can understand that. So you ask, if I come along and say, no, actually invest in some coaches. Those coaches could do some brilliant work with these kids and really help them with childhood obesity. And people will go, well, prove it. And what I might do is I'll go, well, okay, yes. And so the coaches go and they do this work and they say, yeah, that's fine, but that's not any more important than any of the other things. And right. I go, well, I think it is because you could have a brilliant facility and a bad coach and you'll have a terrible experience. But if you have a great coach and a poor facility, they'll have a great experience. People go, prove it. And I go, mm, okay, that's interesting. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I'm trying to find mechanisms by which to take what we believe to be true. And we know, sorry, we know to be true because we've seen it in front of our eyes and actually find a means by which to accurately tell that story in a way that yes. I don't think is our, our scientific method actually serves particularly well. I agree. I think there's a big difference between knowing something to be true as a, from like on a human perspective mm. and then knowing something to be true because we've proven it through science or through facts or through measurement. Mm. Um, I think that those don't always, they're not always opposite things. I think they could be hand in hand, you know, I mean, that's, isn't that really what science is? Some scientist believes something to be true as a human being and then goes out and uses the scientific method to prove using facts that his original belief was true. Um, but I think our issue is we believe many things to be true in the realm of youth sports development or just youth sports. And yet we struggle to find ways that are valid under the eyes of the scientific method to prove that they are true, meaning that they are re reproducible yeah. and consistent over time, no matter who is using them. And I think that's the big thing. Like I can come into my gym and do the same thing in my gym and know that I'm going to get similar results from, you know, the majority of the athletes in my gym, if I'm using, if I'm going about things this way, but somebody taking and doing the exact same thing in a different gym may not get the same results because they're not me, <laughs> you know? And so that's where that realm of complexity comes in. I think where that there's so many variables involved mm. that it's hard to measure. And that's why I think we struggle to measure it is because the amount of variables that come into play and we want to just, you know, we're, we're fascinated with picking one or two things and saying, these are the two, these are the things that matter the most. And so we're going to measure those things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have a lot of struggle with that because I find that as soon as we isolate out, apart, we're no longer really looking at the whole similar to, you know, drills versus games. I don't know, but, <laughs> um, it, it, as tempting, as tempted as I am to go down that rabbit hole with you, we've, we've been there before. So I, yes. I'm going to resist the temptation. <laughs> um, um, and I am going to, but I am going to shift gears actually, because um, sure. uh, also as much as I, as much as I want to, uh, as I like talking about complexity science, I know not everybody's a fan. So um, the one thing we were going to talk about, um, and you know, you you um, 
sort of posed a question on, uh, you know, one of those nice conundrums that you posed for me um, on Twitter around the talent needs trauma uh, thing. So why don't you kind of frame the discussion for us and then we'll see where we end up. Sure. I think, I mean, over the last five years, maybe I've heard that term, that phrase many, many times. Uh, I, I don't know where I originally heard it the first time, uh, but I've definitely heard it. I've heard it on podcasts. I've heard it out of talent developers. I've heard it from coaches. I've heard it across the world in a lot of different uh, medium, in a lot of different contexts. This idea that talent needs trauma. That I don't know. And I think part of the problem is that a lot of people uh, mean when they use the word talent, they mean different things, and yet they all latch on to the same phrase, talent needs trauma. And you, uh, in a couple couple podcasts ago, I don't really know when it was actually time-wise for you when you did the interview, but I know for me, it was just a couple weeks ago, I was listening to a podcast, and I don't actually remember who it was that you were interviewing or talking with, but that concept came up. And it was something you didn't really go into. You just mentioned it. You said talent needs trauma or, or, you know, something along the lines of, yeah, there's this idea that talent needs trauma. And then you said, I'm not really sure that I fully believe in that idea. And then you guys moved on in your conversation and didn't really go into it at all. And I had, I know for me personally, I had already been um, critically thinking about that phrase because I've used that phrase as a coach. I've used it with some of the parents that I work with. I've used it with some of the coaches that I am developing. And I've used it meaning, hey, if we want these kids to become the best possible volleyball players they can be, they're going to have to have some traumatic experiences. And even as I say it, I laugh because I'm like, how can I actually say this? But um, they're going to need some trauma in order to bring out the best version of themselves. That's how I've used it. Yeah. And I am definitely questioning not only the validity of that, but the morality of it, I guess, in a sense. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the reason why I posed the question to you. was like, And so I would want to ask you, when you mentioned that in that podcast, you said it's not something you're very – you're really um, – uh, too keen on anymore or ever were i don't know i would like to ask you why why you think that phrase talent needs trauma has issues well um I, th- I think i remember the conversation i think it was the podcast with um nick winkleman um where i think we were talking about just general ideas around talent development and some of the scientific stuff i think um i think what i was referring to as well was I think I don't know if the it's not necessarily just that I'm uh, less convinced by it, but I think also um, so I think the co- the phrase was coined uh, in from a paper written by um, Dave Collins and uh, a couple of colleagues whose names escaped me. I'm pretty certain it would have been Anya McNamara because uh, she's worked very closely with him on the development of what they term the um, psychological characteristics of developing excellence, PCDEs. Yes. And they posit the idea that, um, or there was a paper written with this headline of talent needs trauma. And it was based around the idea that, um, uh, well, it was lo- uh, driven by some of the research that was emerging. And, and there's another subsequent piece of research, I don't know if you've read it, called the Great British Medalist Project. Yes. Yeah. So in that in that study, um, there they uncovered essentially this difference between uh, super elite multi medalists and your, your kind of ordinary gold medalists because that's what you have. That's what we have in Britain these days, you know, because we've got quite good at <laughs> you just have your your everyday gold medalist. And um, and the difference between your kind of super elite and your and your sort of elite athletes, what well they uncovered a correlation that the super elites had experienced some kind of of a developed childhood or developmental tra- trauma. And so, you know, that, that, I don't think there was necessarily even a, a hypothesis that uh, suggested, but there was this, essentially this, they just highlighted the fact that there is a correlation between these two things. Now, the problem with that is, is that 
people jump to logical conclusions as a result. So here's a correlation. So therefore, the assumption is that, that a traumatic experience could be valuable from a life, um, you know, a kind of a, a developmental uh, perspective, or at least that's a very tempting conclusion to arrive at. And, and, and I think the talent needs trauma idea uh, sort of stems from a lot of these different arguments um, that, you know, uh, super elite athletes tend to experience trauma, tend to overcome it and, and become stronger from it. And as a result, um, you know, the, 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 it, it's, a, it's a formative moment in their lives. The, the problem there is, of course, that, um, again, we're talking about human beings and we're talking about a range of variables. So what we don't know, for example, is how many people uh, experienced that level of trauma and it, it destroyed them. Um, right. You know, and there could be loads. Um, we don't know as well if, for example, um, if certain types of traumatic experience or certain environmental um uh, parameters need to be in place for somebody to be able to recover from that sort of traumatic experience. Um, so uh, it, it's you know so um, the point I'm trying to make, I suppose, is that um, just because we know that super elite athletes tend to have this kind of experience, we can't draw the attention that talent needs trauma. And even Dave, uh, recent, well, relatively recently, uh, has published several, I think, or a number of sort of response papers. Uh, repositioning this concept around it's not talent needs trauma it's that talent overcomes trauma or talent manages with trauma um, but of course that's not as pithy a headline is it so it's harder to uh, <laughs> get people to buy into that idea well I think that's a great change there when they that change to talent overcomes or talent manages because my thought on it had come to the point where I was thinking first to address, you know, another issue with it is that idea that how many, I mean, if we're just going to talk athletics, how many athletes have faced the same or worse trauma, overcome it and yet not become great. Oh yeah. That too. Yeah. You know, I mean, so that seems like a really, to, that's where I feel like on the moral level, it starts to be a little iffy because if if we're putting that f that that message out, talent needs trauma. It, we're we're like, are we are we crossing some ethical line when when we're trying to sh like bring that idea to parents to athletes to say, whoa, if you want your kid to become amazing, they're gonna have to face some trauma in life. Um, and then what does that get taken as? Well, that's part of the path. That's on that linear path to becoming an amazing athlete. Is we've got to figure out, you know, some traumatic experience. <laughs> like I can just see parents taking that. We under we all I think all the coaches start to understand that the levels and the depth to which parents will sometimes go to to ensure that your kid has athletic success. And if you put that message out there that talented athletes all had some sort of incredible trauma that they had to overcome in their life i really honestly could see parents searching for traumatic things to expose their kids to in order to make sure they become great athletes and that scares me i, I agree and um and but having said that there could be a counter argument here which is that if we know that um if we know that the journey towards um, achieving one's potential, whatever that might be, does require a degree of um, resilience, of uh, desire, dedication, hard work, um, commitment, um, willingness to suffer on occasion, um, these sorts of things. Um, and, and there aren't many sporting endeavors um, well, there aren't many endeavors in life that don't require some of at least some of those attributes then one of the ways in which uh young people can uh begin to explore their own capabilities at dealing with or, or developing these attributes within themselves is is through overcoming obstacles overcoming challenges and 
Um, that's probably where challenge point theory comes from. The idea of if we can put the right kind of roadblock in place to create what they term the, the rocky road, um, is that something that can be useful from a learning and development perspective? Now, that's not to say we need to go to things that are genuinely traumatic. And I think often it's the word trauma that's the problem because yes. it engenders an idea of something that's really quite serious. Uh, yeah, I don't yeah, think yeah. we're necessarily saying that, but I do think we're always trying to find the right balance between challenge and something that's too stressful that it creates the after the athlete crumbles. I completely agree. And I think another important point there is when you listed off those qualities of grit, resilience, my one of my favorite words we use in our gym is the Finnish uh, word sisu, which is kind of one of those all-encompassing concepts that covers all of those things. Um, I, I look at those as tools. And I think that's what talent needs. Talent needs the tools. Talent doesn't need the trauma. Talent needs the tools, the correct tools, to face trauma when it comes. And so we see all these amazing athletes, high-level Olympic athletes or whatever level they're at, and they've had these traumatic experiences in their lives, and they all have that in common. And we say, well, that's then the trauma correlates to their success. But again, I'm sure there's probably a lot of other athletes out there that have faced similar or worse trauma who didn't make it to that level. And so what is the thing that these athletes who made it to the highest level had that those don't? The tools, the tools to deal with that trauma. And so I think personally my belief on it is that it's, more about those tools than it is about the actual traumatic experiences or the challenges that they've had. Similar to like what you said about the challenge point theory, if we're challenging athletes to do something in our training sessions and they don't have the tools to deal with that, then that challenge point is too far out for them. It's too far away for them to get any benefit from it. And so I think we have to, when we look at it, we've got to make sure that they they're equipped for the journey. Um, that doesn't mean 100%, but it still means that they have the needs. You know, one of the ways that I've seen that talent needs trauma rephrased as a catchphrase is that idea of we need lions in our path. Um, and I, I, I certainly like that idea, but if you don't have the tools to fight a lion, you're going to die. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and so, yeah, it's great to have lions in your path, but you need to be prepared to have lions in your path. And so you take the right tools to fight off a lion if you're going to see one. It's the very rare individual who faces a lion on their path without the tools who actually comes away unscathed or, you know, even alive. So I think that's a huge, important thing that people gloss over when they start talking about this talent needs trauma idea is, no, I think what talent needs is the tools to face trauma which is that resilience and grits and you know decision making capability? Um, they don't necessarily need trauma, so that's you, my thoughts on it. You read my mind, um, and I, I sort of feel like I kind of like need to like uh, bring Jamie on the call um, because that's something he says all of the time. Uh, so Jamie's a performance coach. He works with some. Um, really high profile elite uh, soccer players over here uh, Premier League guys and he talks about tools but he, he doesn't only do that he also does lots of other things like one of the things he does is uh, he does a he runs kind of like a, a not for profit called Strut Camp and it's basically for uh, for girls who say struggle with confidence and it's about and his tagline is don't walk through life strut um, and it's about giving them the tools and he says he says in, in sport most and in life um, most people, they're trying to climb a mountain, get the very top of Everest or whatever, um, and they've basically got like a light rain jacket on. <laughs> <laughs> they just haven't got the equipment to get there. <laughs> Doesn't matter how good a climber you are, you're gonna you're gonna die from um, uh, you know um, ex exposure. So, um, and and, he, and so his mission is to help young people to develop the tools. Now, some of the tools uh, you can develop through, you know, dialogue, et cetera, et cetera. But some of the tools, actually, we as coaches can um, can uh, 
help with because we can create an environment within which they can, in a safe-to-fail type environment, explore the development of those tools. Um, right. And that's one of the reasons I believe what we do is so important because we're not only doing the sport piece, we're also doing the the sort of... Um, the, the the wider development of under, you know of, of dealing with adversity and overcoming overcoming um, failures and these sorts of things. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I think it's uh, that's a great. I mean, first off, he's got a great tagline for <laughs> business. I love that. Uh, um, I might steal that, um, <laughs> but it's yeah. I think it is those tools. You know, I love that idea that we're you know. Everybody wants their kid to be on top of Mount Everest, but not everybody's given their kid the tools to get there. You know, you can't hand a kid a light rain jacket and expect them to end up on the top of Mount Everest. You have, they have to get the tools. And that doesn't mean we hand them the tools. That means we give them, you know, we we provide the environment in which they learn which tools are going to be necessary to use. You know, I mean... If you take that analogy further and you think about how does someone train to climb Mount Everest, I have a one of my early volleyball coaches actually climbed Mount Everest and actually uh, died on Mount Everest. And, uh, um, you know, his uh, experience was, you know, to get to that point, to be able to be feel competent enough to climb Mount Everest, which he did twice before his the, the accident, um, you know, he he didn't climb Mount Everest. He did a lot of stuff in that, what you call that safe to fail environment. You know, there was a lot of the opportunities to use the right tools and what tools might actually be more applicable in this situation. And those were things that he or anybody who's in that endeavor is exploring before they go out there. You don't just buy a plane ticket and fly across the world and go climb Mount Everest. You, you discover how, you know, a little bit of how to do it and the kind of that safe to fail. And I think that's a great analogy to uh, how we help athletes and how we help people grow. And, you know, is that safe to fail um, environment? And so I, I, I think maybe that's the, the thing, you know, that's why, like you, maybe you said the the trauma is the wrong word because what we're creating in our gym is not traumatic. It's challenging, but there's no trauma. You know, I mean, yes, there's the kid that hurts themselves or, you know, blows out their ACL or the kid who hurts her shoulder or whatever. And those could be traumatic, but those aren't the things those, I certainly don't ever want to wish any of those on an athlete. Um, it's the challenge in the gym that creates the opportunity for growth. And, but again, it only creates an opportunity. What, what allows them to actually capitalize on that opportunity is the development of the tools to meet that challenge. I, I, I totally agree. I suppose the only bit that we need to work out between us or we need to work out, generally speaking, is where does that challenge point come and, and how challenging does it need to be? So I'm mindful. I, I'm, I, I, I'm always slightly concerned if an athlete... Um, sort of has a really kind of uh, easy path to, you know, kind of like the national level, especially a youth athlete. So if a youth athlete is a fairly seamless, you know, they just kind of flowed there, this, that and the other, I always get slightly concerned about that because I feel that um, they haven't yet hit the roadblock. And because it's all been so easy for them, the danger is that they get to this, you know, ostensibly a, a very high level as a junior. And then they hit this wall because all of a sudden it gets really hard and really serious. And they're not they haven't had any previous experiences to overcome that. And I think that's where often we can see some of our most gifted. And I'm using that that word in air quotes, our most <laughs> able athletes fall away they drop away because yes. they've not been given a, a coping strategy even in the safe to fail context so that's why again i believe that in that developmental space unless we're doing that unless we're giving them those experiences and learning from those setbacks i think um 
we're not equipping them. We're not giving them the tools. And so anybody who's out there as a coach thinking that it's got to be all about big smiles, uh, particularly with the ad- young kids, sure, have a great time. It's all got to be fun. But as you start to develop and as you start to improve, I, I always say that in my sessions that we're particularly with like, you know, talented, you know, your 15, 16 year olds kind of on the journey. If they come away smiling, I don't think I've quite done the job. I want them to be a bit disgruntled, you know, yes. slightly annoyed, you know? Yeah, I, I would agree completely. I think it's we, you know, I, you, the Carol Dweck's work just popped in my head because of that. I mean, you're thinking not only are you talking about the athlete who is, uh, one of the best on their team all the way up until they hit a certain level and then suddenly they are not equipped to, to deal with the next level. You're talking about the kid who's uh, ace in all of their science tests and being amazing in math or, you know, whatever it might be. And then they get to the higher level. They get to, you know, college or university or they get out into the real world where they actually have to apply all these things that they've learned and they can't. And suddenly they real they think, well, I'm not good at this anymore. Um, and in, I think of the same is very true of, you know, in our system here in the United States, we have this high school and club system that works kind of, uh, counter each other. And then you go from that and the goal of every athlete, well, not the goal of every athlete, but the goal of athletes within these systems is to go and play in college. And we have so many athletes who are there, you know, they're the best player on their high school team. They're the best player on their club team. And then they get to college where every player that there's on their team and every player on every team that they're playing was also the best player on their club team and high school team. Yeah, yeah. And they face these players and they and they they struggle and they're the low person on the totem pole for the first time in their life. Yeah. And so many of them, they give up, they quit, they can't handle it. They don't know how to they don't know how to persevere. They don't know how to see that as a challenge rather than a threat. And they and they pull away from it and they quit. And they give up the sports, and some of them, they give up sports entirely because that message that they've received is, I guess I'm not as good as I thought I was. And when the reality is you are as good as you thought you were, but so are all these other people. <laughs> and, and, for, and for many of them you know, as well, it, it, their, um, their self-worth is wrapped up in their sports performance. Yes. And, and of course, then the minute they have that kind of, I'm not the best anymore, they have seri- seriously question who they are and what they're, and, and what, what, what they are. And I think that's a major stumbling block for a lot. I agree. Yeah. I think, I mean, that's because they've been, their whole youth sporting environment has been about, um, about them as an athlete and how good they are as an athlete. It's never been about, the effort or the resilience that they put in to get there. It's simply been about their results. Um, you know, we have kids who would rather be on a winning team and sit the bench and never play than be on a losing team and play all the time because of that. Yeah. Because it looks better to be on a winning team. Um, you know, we have kids who would rather when they're going off to college, they would rather know that they're going to be a starter on a team that, uh, or I'm sorry, the other way around. They would rather know that they are going to be on the bench of a college team that finishes in the top in their conference than know that they're going to start for a team that might finish, you know, in the bottom half of their conference. Um, and that to me speaks to that idea that they, they, their whole sense of self is wrapped up in not only their own ability as a player, but in team sports is wrapped up in the results of their team. How well my team performs (laughs) speaks to my own self-efficacy. And I think that's a, we get there because of that path that you were just talking about. It's, it's, a little seamless, so it's a little too easy. You know, these kids are identified early as, "Oh, you're going to be, you're going to be good," and so we're going to make sure you are in these opportunities to always be good. Instead of saying, "You know, you might be good, but you're going to have to go out and prove it just like everyone else," and we're, and I think the the thought that came to my mind when you were talking about that was, 
Um, there's that book. Uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to read it yet, but it's called the end, the end of average. Um, probably one of the best books I've read in the last five years, um, really influenced, uh, our thought process here in the gym as far as how we coach. And I think that is the issue in that we tend to coach to the average kid in our gym or we don't, but I think as a cultural, um, experience uh most places tend to coach to the average kid in the gym and so the kid who's above average it has that seamless track until they're no longer above average um and if we can instead coach to the each individual athletes in, that's in front of us and make sure that each individual athlete is challenged to a degree that allows them to feel uh, still competent and able to accept that challenge and still confident in their ability to tackle that challenge, I think then we we create more resilient athletes because if an athlete is always challenged from the time they're young until they die, <laughs> then they're never going to be afraid of that challenge. But if we, you know, if we're not creating those challenges for them, if we're just giving them that, you know, here you go, you're on the first team here you go, you're on the first team next year, and here you go, you're on the first team next year. And it's more about like, well, you know, you didn't really have to work for that. We just know, we, we know there's good things in store for you, so just keep putting you on the first team. And then sometime along the way, that kid's going to have a rude awakening. And if they don't have the tools to to deal with it, they're going to they're, they're gonna fall off the mountain, I guess, to complete the analogy. So I think the, this is the, the major challenge. Uh, well, not challenge, but the, they're one of the burdens that we carry as talent coaches uh, that people don't get. They don't realize this. That, you know, I mean, um, the, the, the space that we operate in, we have this great uh, responsibility to do this. Now, particularly in a sports context, because so many other aspects of their lives it's just about succeed, 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 succeed. You know, it's about results. It's about, you know, get your, get your grades. It's about, it's about this, it's about that, you know, and some kids just opt out of that altogether and they just say, I'm just not buying into that world. And they just sort of go in that whole kind of different space. Some kids are entirely bought into it. Some are kind of in between. Um, but it, it's kind of that sort of mentality of, you know, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to perform. You've got to perform. You've always got to perform. Um, and in our in our space, when we're not saying that you've got to perform, what we're saying is is that you've got to try. What we're saying is that you've got to you've got to think about it, you've got to work it out, you've got to solve the problem. It's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about this whole approach uh, is is that it's about problem solving. It's about dealing with um, you know managing yourself and working things out. And there's not many other spaces that kids can in, inhabit at the, you know at the moment where they actually genuinely get that and they get that opportunity to genuinely explore and see kind of like who they are and it's and that's why i believe it you know believe in sport and recreation it's recreation um yes and and, and so the bit i was just going to try and say within that is that i suppose but the bit for me that i think is one of the biggest issues is so you get this, I get this. There's other people out there I know out there who obviously listen to this podcast and all that sort of stuff who've read this and they understand this and they understand stuff like flex work and everything else. They've read about PCDs and stuff. But that's not many people and it's not, it's not part, certainly in this country, it is not part of a coach's education. It's not a core part of their education. And for me, it should be almost the starting point. Speaking to... Um, Nick Levette, who's been on the podcast before uh, yesterday, and he was talking exactly about this point. It's just not there. So if they yeah. get it, they're getting it. They're lucky. They're really lucky. It's a you're, it's a happy accident. It's it's definitely not part of the plan. Yeah, yeah. I think you know I had a coach just the other day who was asking me about what we do in our gym for you know this mental training. The you know the big buzzword right now mental training or mental skills or whatever like what do we do in our gym to and i said we we, we play volleyball you know what we don't and the, he's like well you don't make any time to talk about the mental tools like visualization and you know how they talk to themselves and all this stuff i mean no that is built into our culture it's built into the every day's practice we don't have any breakout sessions where we address mental training. I, I know um, a couple of years ago I was reading a 
a book that was, you know, kind of a conglomeration of uh, sports psychology uh, authors, and um, one of them, one of the, the the sections in the book was absolutely my favorite. And I I need to, after having this conversation just a couple of days ago, I was thinking I need to revisit it and find out who the author was so that I can start attributing it to them. But they, the person who wrote it said, you know, the most telling thing towards a person's mental strength as an athlete is the environment in which they are playing their sport. That is the thing that lends itself most to their mental strength, not some, because as you said earlier, that environment then evokes the tools they need to be able to face the adversity that's going to come up in their sporting and their life careers. So it's not about having these sessions that we're going to talk about mental training. It's not about these, I mean, can those be helpful at times? Uh, Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, Dweck showed that has shown that if you teach students how the brain learns, they're going to have better. I think it was Dweck that talked about that, that, If you teach the students how the brain learns and how myelination actually works and all this, you can actually, they actually learn better because they now understand how it works. So I think there's a place for that. But it, I, I find that, you know, these mental training courses that are 12 weeks long and online and all this stuff, I just find that that's, again, we're trying to isolate a part of a complex whole and say we can work on this one thing separate from all the context in which it's in and become better at it. And I think just again, just like the skills on the courts, just like all of the parts, we cannot isolate them out and expect them to become better at them. I think it's just as the ability to perform a, a sporting action on the, on the pitch or on the court is dependent upon the context. I think the same is true of the mental skills, this ability to face trauma or face adversity and overcome it. I think it needs the context and some kids, you know, some kids are going to be really great at facing certain levels, certain types of adversity on the, on the sport, in the sports arena. And then other types of adversity are going to come up and they're going to fold under it. And so in one instance, somebody's going to be like, wow, you're, you're just mentally strong. You've got that. You're just really gritty. And then they fold under the other one and people are, oh, you're weak minded. You need to work on your mental strength. Well, it's context dependent. It's state dependent. And if we're not willing to recognize that we train that in the context of the game, in the context of life, uh, and that's really the only way to get good at it. Uh, I think if we're not willing to do that, then we're doing a disservice to those kids. And and, and you you make a good point about Dweck's research. And it's something that she's become increasingly concerned about. I think is people misrepresenting her work and suggesting that, um, that um, growth mindset is something that you have, so you, you just got it. Oh, okay, I've got it. And, and she's trying to kind of sort of, you know, she's certainly kicking back against that because you can have a growth mindset in one context. You can not have a growth, you can have a fixed mindset and in totally a different one. And the, the goal is to recognize um, uh, situations when you might be displaying kind of fixed mindset tendencies and to then work on them and use different strategies to overcome them. Um, not to say I'm fixed, and even in the same context, you, one day you can have a growth mindset, the other day you can have a fixed mindset. So the idea is, it's a, she says, it's not a, it's not a destination, it's a journey. It's not something you ever get to. It's yeah. something you're always working on. The minute you think it's something that is a destination, you've kind of missed the point. Yep. Uh, I think one of the best comments I've ever heard on that was somebody who said, "As soon as you decide that you have a growth mindset, you have a fixed mindset." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And I, you know, to me, that's exactly it. Like we, as soon as we put a label on something, we've become fixed. And so as long as we're open to the ever changing nature, (laughs) then we are, we have a growth mindset. Um, and as long as we're, I guess you'd have to add to that, that not only are we open to the ever changing nature of it, but that we're actively striving to make it better every day. That's a growth mindset, um, and no, and believing that you can change it is part of that as well. Um, but as soon as you say, ah, I, "I have a growth," you know, "I have a growth mindset," I had a, somebody tell me that about four months ago. A parent came into our gym, was questioning how we do things because we only play games, and uh, I was trying to explain to him how things were going, and he said, "You know what? 
I'm pretty sure I have a growth mindset. And as soon as you said that, I was like, "Uh oh, <laughs> like we're going to have issues here because you just told me you have a fixed mindset, even though that's not what you're saying. Um, so I think that that's a, an important point, too. So anyway. Um, right. So an hour and a half in. Yeah. <laughs> um, Pretty good. <laughs> and we got we got through some good ground there uh, and some deep stuff. So um I've got a, a little girl who uh, needs to be taken to gym club, and she's kind of looking, peering at me through the door as she's oh, yes. putting the whole uh, putting the whole guilt trip on me. So, yeah. as much as I'd love to carry on with our conversation, I've enjoyed every every last second of that ninety minutes. Same here. I really appreciate it. It's always it's yeah. These conversations are becoming um, uh, not only the ones I participate in, but the ones I get to listen to are definitely becoming a, a favorite part of my day or part of my week. So I appreciate it very much. So a um, uh, couple of things just to wrap up before we uh, before sure. we close things off. One is um, just to remind people where they can uh, track you down. I mean, you, you even began, I think, a little bit of a sort of podcasting journey of your own or how far did you get with that? Yeah, I think I got one episode in on that. Um, it's definitely still on the back burner, but you know, I mean, the kids in my gym take priority. So, um, I think, uh, we'll definitely get something going on that, but not right now. Um, uh, so as far as finding me, we have a website, um, risevolleyballacademy.net. Um, and that has, we have a page or two dedicated to just our coaching philosophy on there. Um, you know, I, I'm going to be very honest to the listeners who are out there. I'm what I call a 3M coach. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the brands 3M. Um, I mean, they're a yeah. brand like that. Basically, their whole, I don't know if they're still the same way. And I hope, certainly hope that if somebody who works for 3M hears this, they don't think I'm trying to misrepresent them. But um, my plot, my take on 3M always was that they took a product like a Band-Aid or, or whatever, and they tweaked it a little bit to make it better, and they threw their brand on it and then sold it next to the other one that they actually took to make theirs. Um, and, and that's kind of how I've always been as a coach. I started this journey not knowing anything, and the way that I have always learned is I just take the ideas of other people um, take the ideas that I think are going to work. I tweak them a little bit based on my beliefs and my philosophies to make them work better for my gym. And then I put them out there. And so I don't ever claim that really anything we do in our gym is original. There might be a few things here and there, but for the most part, what we do, we've stolen from other people and made it, you know, made it more, made it our own, I guess. And so if you go to our website and you look at our philosophy page, you look at what we're doing, you're going to see a lot of stuff that's probably going to pop up on uh, other people's websites as well, because I thought, wow, that's brilliant. I'm going to steal that and, you know, and then tweak it a little bit to make it uh, work in our gym under our philosophy and in our culture and in our context. So, um, so rise volleyball academy.net is our website, um, Twitter, rise volleyball, uh, Facebook, rise volleyball, it's either rise volleyball or rise volleyball academy. Um, I have a Pinterest page. Uh, I've somehow managed to create that along the way um, that has all of the books that I read listed on there as a as a recommended uh, reading list for coaches and other um, people in this uh, talent development space. Um, and I think oh, and an Instagram as well as with just Rise Volleyball also. So amazing, brilliant stuff. Um, so, I mean, hey, look, um, Pep Guardiola says that all, all great coaches are just great thieves. So if it's good enough for him. <laughs> I, that's, I, he might be the one that started me on that. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, then, and then the final thing I just wanted to say was um, uh, I hope you have a, a, a great uh, Christmas break and uh, get a little bit of downtime. I'm certainly looking forward to it. It can't come quickly enough. Um, do a little bit of recreation, reconnection, and then uh, come back on the other side uh, bigger and better. Certainly yeah. bigger. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, okay, well, I, I really appreciate you coming on again. Like I said, um, the show's only as good as the guests, and uh, bottom line is I know after this conversation you've certainly helped me to uh, reflect on 
some of the things that I've been doing and some of the some of the things I need to readdress with with my work. So um, if for absolutely no other reason than purely selfish ones, I really appreciate you coming on. Oh, I couldn't. Say, I mean, I, I I almost said that wrong. I definitely can say the same thing myself. I'm already planning on sitting down in front of the computer and typing a bunch of different things in Google to spend my afternoon uh, looking at some of these concepts that we've delved into today. So I appreciate that. Lauren, thanks very much. See you soon. Yeah, take care. Bye-bye. So there you have it. Um, really interesting conversation with Lauren. That there was a lot we really we really delved into there. A couple of really big takeaways from me that I just wanted to share with everybody. Um, love this idea. Talent doesn't need trauma. It needs tools. Um, yeah, you need to have, you need to have lions in your path in order to uh, in order to get better at stuff. But if you don't have the tools to fight the lion, you die. And then the other one for me is if as soon as you think you've got a growth mindset, you have a fixed mindset. Some great takeaways. Uh, have a great week. Enjoy your coaching, and see you again soon. If you enjoy the Talent Equation podcast, I wonder if you'd take a moment to visit my webpage, and you'll see at the top of there that I've got a new Patreon button. Patreon is um, a way of uh, content providers uh, receiving some kind of uh, remuneration for the work that they put out there. The podcast is absolutely free to everybody and it and it always will be. Uh, I'm, I'm resisting the temptation to go down the route of going down uh, for advertisers and sponsors. But obviously the costs, uh, you know, they, they mount up and uh, um, and it's, it's not a, a cheap endeavor to put together a podcast. So um if you, if you value the content, I'm not asking you to do any more than essentially buy me the equivalent of a cup of coffee uh, once a month to uh, to get four episodes into your inbox. Um, and if you're enjoying the conversation, then I'll just be a great big help. So uh, if you wouldn't mind taking the time going over there, then uh, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, in the meantime, um, any questions you've got or you've got any thoughts or observations, please fire them through on the Twitter or also on the, on the website. Uh, you can subscribe in there and be part of the part of the mailing list and I'll make sure that you get uh, each of these podcasts as they come out sent into your inbox. In the meantime, enjoy your coaching. Have a great time on this uh, great journey that we uh, we have with these young people helping them achieve their uh, their potential.